Hey, it's me, the guy who introduces the show. Listen to my amazing voice. Now, check out the amazing Ultimate Draft Kit. The guys spend all off-season creating this bad boy, and they keep it updated all off-season. It's got their full projections, breakouts, sleepers, busts, over a hundred player profile videos. It's even got a mobile app. Has my incredible voice lulled you into a deep sense of trust and commitment? Perfect. Now check out ultimatedraftkit.com and get ready to win your league. Now, back to the show. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. What's going on, Foot Clan? Thursday, July 9th. Back with you, Andy, Mike, and Jason, the Fantasy Footballers. We're beginning our divisional jaunt through the Mm. National Football League today on the show. We have the AFC North divisional breakdown. Have some news to talk about, including a piece of news that broke mere seconds before we hit record today. And it's a doozy. I'm having a bit of a hard time dealing with it. (laughs) It's it's better for some than others. (laughs) And so we will talk about it shortly. Welcome in. A a reminder, we are three times a week now. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Mm. So it is July, and we're three times a week until August, and then we'll be five times a week forever or so it I'm pretty Seems. sure that August is tomorrow. Like it the, the, is very soon. I need to be reminded when August is. I will tell you <laughs> That's that. That's what I'm saying. Like it's just space is folded upon itself. <laughs> and tomorrow I'll go, oh wait, it, we're, it's August? Oh, okay. Sure. Yes, yes. So we have lots to talk about. You heard it at the top. The ultimate draft kit is available right now. Dollar from every UDK goes to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital once again this year. Second year we've worked with them. Very excited about that. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers on Instagram, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. And uh, we should get right into it. We're going to do some buy sell. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. All right, buy or sell, Calvin Ridley, one of the more hyped off-season names. Calvin Ridley will make the jump to 1,100 receiving yards. Now, that would be a jump by definition. Mm -hmm. In 2018, he had 821 yards in 16 games. Crisscross, jump, jump. Big time, double jump, thank you, Yes. yes. Uh, in 2019, last year, he only played 13 games, so he had 866 yards last year. And then 2020, what what's coming for Calvin Ridley? There were 18 wide receivers at that mark last year. It's the highest number of wideouts in the National Football League since 2001 to reach the 1,100-yard mark. So what do you think about Calvin Ridley staying healthy, making the jump jump, what do you got him down for? Oh, my goodness. I have him down for 1,091 yards. Oh, oh. now you're – it's up to you now. That so happened I'm to me last selling. week. selling. I'm apparently <laughs> selling, but uh, it's Well, close. Jason was very excited to reveal something to us, uh, so well, I, I will cede the floor. When I saw this and, you know, I, just seeing this, it's been a while since I statted out Calvin Ridley. I know I was very high on him. After being high, I went back in and investigated his game by game. You know, when did it happen last year? Because his pace was outstanding, right? If you look at from week six on through the rest of the season last year, he was on a pace for 1,142 yards. But a lot of those games just happened to coincide when Austin Hooper was not on the field. Now, Austin Hooper will never be on the field this season, but Hayden (laughs) Hurst will. He's not going to, you know what I mean? It's not like there isn't a tight end where when Austin Hooper went down to injury, 
there wasn't another person there to just fill that void. So I, I did dial him back a little, but when I went to check to see on this buyer's cell, am I buying 1,100 yards? I had to stop and think, did Brooks, did Brooks go in and look at my stats? Because I have him for 1,101 yard. So oh I'm, my goodness. I'm smashing the over. That's a huge buy right there. He's clearly, I am buying the heck out of 1,100 yards at 1,101. <laughs> Of course, that's not much different than Andy's. Yeah, what are you ten, nine no, yards away? Ten ninety one. Yeah, I. So we all have yeah, them right around that form. line. <laughs> that's right. The, uh, so it, this wouldn't be the first time this has happened. So back in twenty twelve, when it was Roddy White and a young bustling Julio Jones breaking into the league, they were both over that mark. Roddy was over thirteen hundred, and Julio was just two yards shy of twelve hundred yards. Uh, I was. A little bit taken back by my very bullish Calvin Ridley <laughs> uh, stat line, because I got I have Calvin Ridley sitting right now just over that twelve hundred yard mark. I have the Atlanta Falcons matching that pace where wide receiver one and wide rec- well, wide receiver two dominated. I agree, Hayden Hurst is going to be there, but it, it, can Hayden Hurst really fill that level of a void that Austin Hooper has while Calvin Ridley? first round wide receiver who's like a, he's coming into a uh, a breakout age breakout potential season here i'm buying it man i'm there's, buying that calvin ridley's going to hit the 1100 yard mark there's a couple of i think things to remember we do talk a lot about looking at you know targets that go away austin hooper was heavily targeted we've talked about the fact that sometimes that ends up transitioning not to a wide receiver too, but to a running back. That happens quite a bit. I also just don't want people to forget about Russell Gage. I mean, he was targeted 74 times last year. Uh, He's a player that fits that middle of the field, uh, Matthew Ryan area as well as Hayden Hurst. So none of that's to say Calvin Ridley can't take that next step. Jason talked about the pace. But there, it's not going to be a binary thing. There will be think, multiple players filling that role. Yeah, I, everybody will be filling it. But if you if you really think about the fact that they started last year with Austin Hooper and Mohamed Sanu, and now they're coming into this year right. with Hayden Hurst and Russell Gage, this is the opportunity for yeah, Calvin good, Ridley to good point. truly, truly step up to be the wide receiver they drafted him to be. Right? They they drafted him to eventually even be the replacement for their wide receiver one. He had that talent coming out. He's a first round draft pick for a reason excellent route runner dominant against zone has had a knack for the end zone so i i do like uh calvin ridley as a breakout player i don't mind your 1200 yard prediction mike but uh at 1101 I, the two of us at least are are buying the 1100 yard mark for ridley 1200 this season. yeah yeah 1200 is very bullish uh it may be a little bit too much but what we know about matt ryan the touchdowns fluctuate but the dude is absolute yardage monster the last eight years he is averaging over 4600 passing yards a season like matt (laughs) ryan is an absolute yardage machine yeah and i am a hard sell at (laughs) 1091 yards so that was buy or sell from pristine auction i'm so distracted by this news guys uh buy or sell from pristine auction check them out at pristineauction.com use the code ballers get a ten dollar credit towards some sweet sports memorabilia let's talk news News and notes from around the league. Well, uh, a a month or so ago, uh, we talked a lot about Raheem Mostert. And I believe he was one of my own personal, was it value breakout, breakout picks, I think on the breakout show. And uh, we talked about the fact the 49ers, man, they're working on another contract for Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert's 28 years old. The guy's got to get paid, right? He... He's got to get paid, and well, and, and the team agreed that the team has been in discussions with Raheem Mostert now for a while about fixing his contract situation. And then uh, we just got a tweet right before the show began from his agent saying, after months of unproductive talks with the 49ers about fairly adjusting Raheem Mostert's contract, we have requested a trade. He said, Dis- disappointing that it would come to this for a guy who led all NFL running backs in yards per carry and helped lead them to a Super Bowl. Now, wait, the, so did the uh, agent drop the yards per carry stat? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he, did. <laughs> he really did. I mean, 
mean, that's fact, an agent's job, right? Hype him up. That's his best stat is he led the NFL in yards per carry. Absolutely. I mean, love, how, how do you not drop the he has the second most rushing yards in history in a playoff game? Like, I'd go with that one. Some personally. people are yard per carry guys, Mike. Some people. Yeah, his agent's big into it. And uh, prob- you're getting an insight probably into the nego- the unproductive talks that have previously <laughs> happened because he was slamming that yards per carry number, which, I mean, obviously I made the argument. We've all we've all seen Raheem Mostert play. We saw him mm-hmm. last year and how good and dynamic he was in the big plays. And that being said, you know, you kind of – I don't blame Raheem Mostert for wanting to get paid. This will be the only time of he gets a chance he to right. do it. He's 28 years old. If he doesn't get paid now off the back of that great season, yeah. he's yeah. not going to – get another good contract. Now, that being said, he is under contract for 2020 and 2021. Yeah, requesting a trade does not... a three-year not, deal. Requesting a trade means nothing. Uh, it does not mean the team is going to trade you, that they have any obligation to trade them. And, you know, the Shanahans uh, don't usually pay up for their backs. They like finding late-round backs and turning them into stars. Um, so, you know, th- to me, I, I, don't, I don't look at this news as some horrific Mostert is gone, Tevin Coleman is shooting up the board because he's the clear-cut starter. Mm. I think this is there's a, there's a ghost in the room, Jason. J- Jarek McKinnon? Jarek McKinnon. My name is I mean, Jeff. I mean, it changes. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jeff Wilson, too, yeah. That's right. It, it changes if Mostert is traded. But as of right Correct. now, and granted, we, we just heard this news, but it, it kind of comes off to me, what? especially the way that this is a... <laughs> A public agent tweet comes off to right. me as posturing, and I don't know that the Niners would have any reason to to give in to it. Well, the, now, the, the one thing that you can say about the 49ers is that you know they can posture themselves and say that they have all the depth in the world, but it, try to say it with a straight face that Tevin Coleman and Jarek McKinnon are going to get you back to a Super Bowl by themselves. Jarek McKinnon hasn't played football in two years he, we still don't know if he will play football this year. Tevin Coleman is perennially in, injured and up and down. Um, I I would hope that they could come to an agreement. But when I saw this news, now I made a transaction to acquire Raheem Mostert in our Dynasty League. This is not, not good news, my friend. It doesn't make me no. feel good at all. It's a real... <laughs> Now, the people that are in the Scotty Fishbowl draft that already drafted Tevin Coleman at a value, they're thrilled. The people who grab most are, are yeah. worried. This but is what too- I wanted to ask, like actionable fantasy stuff. You're in a slow draft. It's, it's going Tevin on Coleman. right now. Well, let, let's say, because Coleman was a later ADP guy at the running back position, uh, as, as has been highlighted from our the mock drafts we've been doing. But let's say you are in round six right now, are you, and you're you're on the clock. You're like you've been looking at a running back. Are you going that early on Tevin Coleman from this piece of news, or Jay? Are you still do? You, are you confident in the? This is just huffing and puffing from a agent. Uh, I I'm fairly confident. I mean, it would it would partially depend on who's on the board. I'm looking at our uh, the draft win right now, and ironically, Raheem Mostert was in the sixth. And if you knew Mostert wasn't there, then I think Coleman would. Uh, would deserve to be there, but since we don't know for sure, I'm not going to take him over a David Montgomery, who we know is going to get a workload, um, and hopefully can't be as bad on a per touch basis as he was last year. So you know, it's gonna it's gonna depend who's on the board, but that's about where Mostert's going right now. I wouldn't draft him where Mostert is going, just based on the potential that it could happen. Okay. Also, Matt Burita, you think they regret that transaction? They do now. <laughs> they might. And and for those asking what happens if Raheem Mostert is traded, not good things by my estimation because for Raheem Mostert to be moved, you know, I suppose that means that another team is willing to make, you know, a contract adjustment Maybe. to trade him, but he's probably going to drop a most turd on some other backfield oh, no. and <laughs> and ruin something for you cuz it's I think, just I think you said the the biggest most important part right it, in order for this the trade most to turd? Ha- the most turd important <laughs> part which is in order for this trade to happen according to the agent is they need to go to a team who's willing to sign him to a new contract yes who what team out there what team in the world is thinking, man, I really want to give up something for Mostert so I could sign him to another deal because he's Raheem Mostert and I have nobody. to have nobody. That's why he's not going to get traded. Well, he's going to stay on the, the Niners and be upset. 
<laughs> he ends up in Miami with Brita. Get ready. Well, no, here's the trade I want to see have happen. I want to see just a one for one player trade, Mostert for Brita. <laughs> just be like, Take hey, would you back. rather would you rather have Mostert? He doesn't want to be here. That'd be Heck funny. yeah, I'd rather have Mostert. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Um couple of other quick updates. There have been some movements with the NFLPA and the NFL on finalizing structure around team travel, uh, things like that. So some positive news about them working together to get mm-hmm. through some of this. Camps are supposed to begin on July 28th, which I they think will. is somewhere in the near future. It is. It's Based tomorrow. On the calendar. <laughs> Everything's tomorrow. <laughs> Everything's yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, see, now we're on the same page. Everything, yeah. Everything is everything, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ES, uh, ESPN's Field Yates uh, reported that uh, this is this is kind of big news. Rex Burke had uh, restructured his contract. He would have been cut if he didn't do this. It's probably a smart move for Burkhead and for the team. He was going to be a cap casualty. Uh, after the Cam Newton signing, we thought Burkhead might leave, which might bring a little bit more clarity to the backfield with Sonny Michelle and Damian Harris and company. But he is going to be around, which means he's going to be around. Like, did did you guys remember that in the first three weeks of the season? Because because Burkhead got hurt as he often does. But the first three weeks, he had a finish of RB twenty and RB ten. Inside you, of those first three weeks. Are you back on the sexy Rexy train, Mike? No, no. I'm just saying like my, my point is if Rex Burkhead is there, he will get touches. That that's that's my only point, is it it affects the the other guys. Like Andy was saying, if Burkhead's not there, you have more clarity, you have more confidence in Sony. Damian Harris becomes like an interesting late round sleeper, but I, I think that that kind of goes away now. Sure. Yeah, I agree. All right, before we move on to the AFC North, uh, Foot Clan, did you know? Did you know that two out of three guys experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? I know it because I have it. And the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. And now thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get a hair loss medication delivered right to your home. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. They deliver your medication every three months, so you could say goodbye to pharmacy lines and awkward doctor visits. Keeps treatments could take up to four to six months to, to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Keeps treatments start at just $10 a month, plus for a limited time, you can get your first month for free. Do it now if you want to save your hair. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash footballers to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash footballers. Foot Clan, we want to thank longtime sponsor of the podcast, Manscaped. Fellas, are you prepared to unveil the summer bot, that post-quarantine bod? Yeah, I don't think any of us are, but Manscaped can help get you ready. They have forever changed the grooming game with the Perfect Package 3.0. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with uh, the Essential Lawnmower 3.0. It's it's the best body hair trimmer on the market. Look, waterproof, cordless. Uh, it, Manscaped has a bunch of other things to help you get that summer bod in the condition it needs to be in as well. Uh, like they have, uh, they have anti-chafing because like eat, no one wants to be in a swimsuit all day. I've always been an anti-chafing kind of guy. You mm-hmm. want me chafing inside of a, a swimsuit? No, 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 no. I am against chafing, fully yeah. against it. <laughs> Support this platform, anti-chafing, and you uh, you can subscribe to the perfect package. Get a new blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered every three months. And for a limited t- uh, limited time, subscribers get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the patented high-performance reduced chafing Manscaped Boxer Briefs. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code FOOTBALLERS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code FOOTBALLERS20. Let's get divisional. You know, if two thirds of men deal with the male pattern bald- baldness, Mike, mm-hmm. then it's kind of heads up me versus you here to to fulfill mm-hmm. it out. I mean, 
Mm. Your, your mother's father. We know the one full third. head of hair for your mother's father. Isn't that the one that's the clue for whether you lose it? Yes, uh, I have heard that is the the tale, and then I would be a doomed. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yes, oh, my that's mom's funny. dad was a bowled. Was a bowled. <laughs> okay, all right. So you'll be the the, the second of the third. Uh, AFC North. Let's talk about the AFC North. Our divisional breakdown. Walking through each of these teams today, beginning with the division winners, the dominant. Baltimore Ravens last year it was well it was a beautiful sight to behold if you're a Ravens fan number one in rushing yards per game number two in rushing touchdowns number one in passing touchdowns scoring differential was plus 249 on the season that's a 15 and a half point per game point differential on average a really really solid defense you look at this offseason a lot of stability on the roster uh, you lost Hayden Hurst. You lost uh, Marshall Yonda, which is a big yeah, that's the loss on the loss. offensive line. But you added a couple of rookie wide receivers in the third and the fifth round, um, and J.K. Dobbins in the second round. And when and you I step think, back, go ahead, Jay. I think you added health in Hollywood Brown. Uh, the injury he had, everybody knew coming in, would be uh, hampering him through season one as a rookie. So I, I do think this team can actually take a step forward, even losing Marshall Yonda. Uh, Pro Football Focus still has this as one of the top offensive lines in football. Um, adding J.K. Dobbins, getting another year for Hollywood. I'm I'm super excited, and and uh, I think getting rid of Hayden Hurst is good for what this team can do through the air. I think it it opens them up more. Well, they uh, it's worth bringing up the name too, James Prochet, their fifth round rookie wide receiver, a name we probably haven't brought up on the show before. I went and watched a ton of his his college tape, and he was a very very good player. I saw in some draft reports for Baltimore, Prochet was considered the steal of the draft for them. So that's another name worth bringing up. But somebody else is going to contribute in this passing game. It's not going to just be Hollywood Brown. And I don't think that we're going to be in a situation like last year where we're just, it's Willie Sneed uh, by default. So I'm curious with your optimism for this offense, Jason, with the way that you have shined a, a light on Hollywood Brown, on Mark Andrews, on just this team in general, do you think that there will be another surprise weapon in the passing game that steps up uh, you know I do not I don't think uh, Miles Boykin or Devin Duvernay these are these are good options um, but I I think it's going to be similar and I've said this before to what we've kind of seen with Kansas City where you have the one two wide receiver tight end punch because those are your most talented players you've got your Tyreek Hill in Hollywood you've got Mark Andrews to play the Kelsey role and then will other people have a big game here or there, catch a long touch, and absolutely. But will they be a fantasy relevant week in, week out starter for a team that runs the ball as much as the Baltimore Ravens? I don't see a third pass catching option beyond Hollywood and Mark Andrews here. Uh, the only thing I, I feel like I really need to add is like it's they will regress with their the offense. We've been talking about that. I don't want to just hark on that more, but the formula of defense and running the ball is still going to work. The team added Calais Campbell yeah. to that defensive line who has been one of, he's been one of the best D linemen now for years and still has it even with Jacksonville's uh deterioration on the defense last year. Calais was still graded out as the third best lineman uh, uh up front and he is just he is an excellent run stuffer. So I think that it's just more of the same for the Ravens. Obviously, an incredible year for Lamar Jackson. Uh, Fantasy-wise, we've talked so much about Hollywood. We've talked about Mark Andrews. I'm sure Mark Andrews is trying to get to the point where we say Travis Kelsey is trying to do the Mark Andrews role as opposed to what, to what you said, where he's trying to fulfill the Kelsey role. That's the evolution that we want to see from Mark Andrews. Mm -hmm. But um, it ain't happening. <laughs> Yeah, probably not. There's just not enough targets. Kelsey's a guy who could be 135, 150 targets if you really wanted. I, I don't know that that this offense could support Andrews in let's, that way. Let's talk briefly about one other aspect of this team 
that could have a pretty big impact on fantasy rosters and, and deeper leagues. And that is just looking at the backfield beyond Mark Ingram. A lot of optimism, excitement, second round pick, J.K. Dobbins. Um, you guys both loved him coming out of college. Obviously, we've talked about him being somebody that, if not this year, could be huge for next year. But that backfield still has Gus Edwards, who uh, 100 plus carries ended up having a great year last year, a lot of it in mop up duty. But do you think J.K. Dobbins will have, let's say this, over under, he'll be start worthy in five games this year? Now, that doesn't mm. mean that you'd be able to predict it, but I'm just saying at the end of the year, do you think you're going to look back and say J.K. Dobbins gave you fantasy production Oof. in five games? Yeah, if I don't have to predict it, then yeah, I'll take the over on five. Like yeah, best he, ball, you know? 100%, yeah. I think he'll be over on five if you don't have to predict it, but it's going to come in, you know, touchdowns, maybe a breakaway run here or there. Um, I, I have him with 139 uh, rushing attempts. Andy, I know you and I have a water bet as to whether or not it's going to be Gus Edwards as the number two to start the year or J.K. Dobbins. I think J.K. Dobbins immediately takes over for Gus Edwards and his 133 carries last year. So in this offense, with the fact that, I mean, you've, you've just got to, when you've got to play against the rushing ability of Lamar Jackson, you can't stop these electric running backs. And that's what both J.K. Dobbins and Mark Ingram are. So I do think he will have a lot of games. Uh, of relevance, I would obviously much rather have Mark Ingram if we're talking about for this season in a startup, in a uh, in, you know any kind of redraft, even in a keeper league. I, I think sometimes people get a little carried away with keeper leagues saying, um, "Oh, but he's younger." Like you're you're only keeping a couple guys here. I would much rather have Mark Ingram. All right, let's move on to the eight and eight Pittsburgh Steelers. What a bewildering season it was for them. Twenty ninth in rushing yards per game. 31st in passing yards per game. They essentially deleted their offense. Uh, they acquired a defense when they traded for Minka Fitzpatrick and turned that entire team around, really threatened for the playoffs, which is a testament to Mike Tomlin and his ability to kind of just piece together a season that was destroyed when Big Ben went down. Mm -hmm. Underwhelming performances last year from Juju Smith-Schuster, from James Conner. Um, Looking at the James Conner narrative, we've talked about it every d which way and around. It, he's a tough case for fantasy owners this year because... Yeah, he is. You know, last year in the draft, very high draft capital player, somebody that we saw two years ago absolutely uh, dominate when we thought Lev Bell would be back. He wasn't back. And then James Conner, week after week, was this incredible value. He's missed 11 games so far in his career. He's had four other games where he left early with injury. And so we've seen comments from this team, from Tomlin, from uh, from their general manager, Kevin Colbert, from Rooney, talk about the injury problems. Uh, you know, Tomlin earlier in March said, you know, he didn't spend a lot of time on the field healthy. That is as much a part of the game as blocking and tackling. He's talking about the health. We're going to assess the situation with him in order to minimize injury. So do you read into that? Do they spread the workload around? You know, you've had some of those negative comments. You've also had Tomlin come back and say, well, yeah, he's our guy because look at the backfield. I mean, what choice do you have but to say that? So I think he's just one of the more enigmatic kind of, you're either going to be really, really happy with the pick or you're going to be really sad is kind of where I think you're going to end up. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. And it's it's so tough with the way that ADP is just laying out with the, the, the other players who are going around him. I still believe in James Conner, I believe in the talent, and believe that if he is healthy and plays, you know, 14, 15 games, that he will end up as a top 12 running back. The, uh, the I went and looked at the stat, because I, I saw you were, Andy, we're going to talk about how he's missed 11 games. You know that Lev Bell missed 14 games in his last three years with the Steelers? And I'm not talking about the holdout year, otherwise that number will be much larger. <laughs> but, like, running backs get hurt. And Le'Veon Bell was viewed as this like superstar, just nonstop. He's a fantasy stud, but he missed a lot of games. Like if you remember, there was the two years in a row where he he took uh, massive knee injuries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, running backs do get hurt. It's just a matter of does the team philosophically think they have to? Like when the GM came out and talked about it, he made a point of saying this is not one injury. This is sure this injury. Then it's this injury. Then it's this injury. Then it's I'm leaving early. Do they start to think it's their fault? Do they start to think we have to control the workload? 
possibly. Or do they I, cut him? Or do they cut him loose because in the in the nature of the NFL, if you're run, if he's that much better than the guys around him, you have to have him on the field. I think I he'll be a workhorse. The, the, sorry, I would say the the GM had the uh, had his opportunity in the draft to do something about it. Didn't do anything about it. Did something and, about it. Little Bitsky. I mean, Anthony Little McFarland. Bitsky yeah, is Little right. Bitsky is the, is <laughs> I mean, the emphasis. Yeah, he but, did draft Anthony McFarland. Was fifth round, right? Uh, you fourth or fifth round, but Anthony McFarland's like a 180 pound dude. Uh, and, and wait, my point was the GM could have done something then. Once it's Sunday, that that's out of the GM's hands. Now it's on. Correct. It's Mike Tomlin's decision. Jason, you were going to weigh in. Yeah, I, I think to start the year, Connor is going to be the workhorse back until he can't handle it. And if he gets injured, then you're going to be sad the rest of the season along because then they're going to monitor and, and, and change it up. That being said, you look at like, okay, he's going right next to David Johnson in drafts. Who would you rather have? I, I'm more confident that David Johnson, you know, will, will have more work there. But at the same time, on a per snap per game basis, I think the upside you have to go with James Conner here. Well, I think it's just philosophical, right? I mean, you, I would have David Johnson. I've got him ranked higher, and I would take him because both of those guys are going to slide in as my running back too. So I'm looking at that running back too. I am looking for consistency of being on the field, and I think I will have that with David Johnson. We talk about him being a volume guarantee. I do not. How think many games has David Johnson missed in the last three years? He's he's missed a lot, but he's he's. <laughs> More than James Conner. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, well, I the mean, he, play, he played last year. I mean, he, he wasn't I, out last year. He missed uh, quite he missed a bit three of games. last year. But um, the, the tough thing with James Conner, I think, and I remember this, right? It was our Halloween episode. Uh, it was one of our SiriusXM uh, live shows. And we had the the question of, you know, if who name a player and who's a Halloween candy. It, and I remember loving this analogy. It was James Conner was a Three Musketeers bar because – you know, he's kind of hard on the outside, but he's just soft yeah. nougat in the middle. And that's how it felt because he kept going back in these games yeah. and then leaving. The, even when he started and finished a game, he would leave halfway through. It's just like when you're watching it, he and that's, couldn't stay That's up. why I like your point, Jason, is that if he goes down, he may be kind of deleted from fantasy relevance in terms of he, the team's not going to give him a sixth try to be the, the workhorse. Whereas I feel like, you know, all things being equal – David Johnson's more guaranteed, but that's the tier you're in. I mean, you're you're shooting for a much higher upside with Connor. Connor has the much higher potential to return somehow to 2018 form, get healthy. Was by far the best guy on the field last year when he was healthy. Um, but we don't have to say there. Let's talk about some of the other. This is why. Let me just throw this out because our our whole goal here in this show is to help you win a championship. This is why this year, more than any year I can remember, smashing running backs in the first two rounds and getting two really good guys. Because I, so you I don't have at, to have these conversations. So you don't have to have these conversations because you look at the wide receivers that are going around these guys, and it's like Amari Cooper and Odell Beckham, and you know, this, the, uh, Cooper Cup. I would rather have these wide receivers and better running backs. Um, so that's the way I'm I'm leaning this year. I almost like it, and even if you don't take running backs in those first two rounds, I, I might just do basically a version of of zero running back where I don't want to choose one of these guys. You know, you know what I mean. Like I just this tier is of running backs is 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 gross when you look at the wide receiver value you could have, and then see if you can fill in with later round running backs. Yeah, there's certainly the possibility that you know. Guys like Kareem Hunt, guys like Devin Singletary can do as much for your team as James Conner. Right. So there, yep. there is that possibility. Big additions, not really an addition, but he is. Big Ben's coming back. And then Eric Ebron was signed at tight end. Uh, means a lot for Big Ben in my estimation, even if Ebron is a little up and down, which is kind of, I think mm -hmm. that's his family crest. Uh, but <laughs> Chase Claypool added in the second round, wide receiver. Big bodied wide receiver, and then Anthony McFarland was a fourth round pick. I think it said fifth earlier. Yeah, running back, scat type of back. Mm -hmm. um, Says he weighs two hundred pounds, but he doesn't. He's one of those guys where it's <laughs> yeah, like, I like me, him, man. I really too. like oh, him. Oh, oh, he was electric. Mike and I loved him when yes. we scouted him. It, it, he looked great, but you want to talk about an injury prone little yeah. guy? That's yeah. Yeah. that's Anthony McFarland. So uh, those were the big additions. Obviously, Deontay Johnson coming into his sophomore year. Juju Smith-Schuster, this is his final season. He's an unrestricted free agent after this year. Which is wild, man. It feels strange. It really yes. does. It was like last year didn't exist, Mike, for the Steelers. Yes. 
So uh, other kind of considerations with this team, what do we think? Can they I, I win think the Deontay division? Johnson, Deontay Johnson is the name that I think people listening really want to know about. Do we believe he has that breakout year? He was the best wide receiver last year with the crappy quarterback play. He did most of his damage with Duck Hodges, um, which is impressive that you can even do damage with Duck Hodges. <laughs> um, he, you know, he was up near the top of the league in yards of separation He's a good player, and you know he's you he's know, also he's, a very popular player in fantasy circles right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean personally, I feel like he's being a little overhyped. Um, I don't see the ceiling being that you know people are like, well, he's he's the same size and height and weight, and you know, conference is Antonio Brown, and now he's got Big Ben back. It's like, oh, hold, hold, you hold up. Antonio um, Brown made a lot of money for players that size. That's yes. what I think <laughs> happened. Um, so I, I I think he's uh, a quality. Um, wide receiver out there, but I I would still be putting my money on Juju to be the number one here. So now, the big the big decision is is Deontay's an eighth round pick and Juju's a fourth round pick for fantasy drafts right now. So do you believe? And I think I've made the contention that I have I, I believe the odds of Deontay Johnson being the most fantasy relevant wide receiver are high enough to where I'd rather have him in the eighth than Juju in the fourth. Do you guys look at Juju in the fourth as the better, more secure pick there, or do you do or do you agree? To me, this is entirely about what you believe in Deontay Johnson. That's how you led your statement, right? If you are listening and you're like, man, I really believe in Deontay Johnson. I like what I saw. I think he has a breakout chance. Then don't draft Juju in the fourth. There's a ton of great wide receivers in the fourth. Um, to me, I don't believe that about Deontay Johnson. So if I had to pick one of these guys, I'd rather have Juju. Yep, I, I would take Juju as well. So, Jay, for... As the resident Eric E. Braun Truther yeah. on on this show, uh, it didn't work out for Vance McDonald last year, but again, didn't work out for very many Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, so a couple years ago, when Vance was you know joined the team, he went fifty receptions for six hundred and ten yards and four touchdowns. But that was also during Big Ben's monster year. So even with fifty receptions, Vance was still just an eleven percent target share, which is. Like that's not the number that you are hoping for. Do you do you have Eric Ebron going at I, that eleven percent, or do you think he can be higher? I I have right now Eric Ebron at eleven point six percent of the target share, which means he's going to be serviceable, have his games, you know, over five hundred yards, probably seven or more touchdowns. Um, but I I'm not really excited. If you're in a you know something like the Scotty Fish Bowl, sure, that's where Eric Ebron uh, might be good, or a best ball league, but. I don't think he's going to have a big breakout campaign here. Um, he'll be third in the pecking order in targets. Are we completely writing off James Washington? Yep, I. Am. <laughs> but I. But to be All fair, right. I did that when he was drafted as a rookie. So yeah, that is, yeah. I've just stayed the course. Well, the the one thing that is strange about James Washington is that if you were looking at Deontay Johnson last year and the impressive numbers and the success he had. It's a little bit intellectually dishonest to not acknowledge James Washington having an impact in the offense and just pick and choose this offseason. Well, one guy can take a step forward, the other can't guy can't. It's true. So I, I'm true. glad that you brought him up, Mike, because you know, I don't know if it's because of the Claypool pick and how we slot the wide receivers in, but Washington has not been brought up. James Washington had fifty more yards than Deontay Johnson in one fewer game. There um, you go. So that that kind of lays the the intellectual dishonesty. If you're all about Deontay Johnson and not liking James Washington, I don't believe in either of them. And and as a final thought, and and kind of how when I'm looking at Pittsburgh's wide receiver core, it's going to come down to much like it does with Tom Brady, who's got the trust of Big Ben. Which guy is mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time when Big Ben needs you? Is that going to be Deontay Johnson? Is Juju going to take that mantle again now that those two are back together? Uh, a and lot that, of upside in the offense that didn't exist there last year. That's exactly with Big why I go, Juju. You've got yeah, years of experience with him. When when Big Ben finally got back and had the whole shave his did beard you video. A, did you throw an S on the end of that year of experience? with him? <laughs> It's all he's got, right? No, what, he had two no, he's got awesome two. years with Big Ben. I did throw yeah. an S on that. Um, You're is this his fourth year? Yes, that's why he's. That's why it's his last he, year. He's a time traveler, Mike. <laughs> he had two awesome years. His rookie and sophomore year were awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think he's got a rapport. When Big Ben had his whole shave the beard video and and um, got back out to practice, who was he with? He was with Juju. So I think that's the the rapport. And you know, when Big Ben has a favorite, he just locks he on and says, and, "Let's do this." 
And remember, I'm not calling... Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying Juju is DeAndre Hopkins. But DeAndre Hopkins was turning into an elite wide receiver and then at, right around the age of 24 had that just monster tank bust of a season because his quarterback play was just not something he could overcome in 2016 and he ended up as the wide receiver 30. Juju's I am 100% hearing what you're not saying there, Mike. You made <laughs> a direct comparison between the two. So, all right, now uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the Cleveland Browns. This is not the Juju show. Uh, six and 10 last year. A big old wet fart of a season in every way, oh, shape, and just form. No, <laughs> nobody was in more commercials than Baker Mayfield, and nobody had a worse season, honestly, than Baker Mayfield. When you combine expectation with actual performance on the field, in my opinion, Baker Mayfield was the single biggest bust in national in the NFL and in fantasy football for what you hoped he could provide for Odell Beckham Jr., for what you thought he would be in fantasy drafts. And so this is a make-it-or-break-it year for Baker Mayfield, without question. Uh, now he's got a brand new head coach and a brand new offensive coordinator. Alex Van Pelt takes over at offensive coordinator. Uh, Kevin Stefanski is the new head coach. I don't know if you guys knew this. Alex Van Pelt was an offensive coordinator once upon a time. Hmm. 2009 in Buffalo for just a oh. brief moment in time. All I can hear is Scott Van Pelt. That's uh, <laughs> that's all I'm picturing. Well, they're yeah, unquestionably say- related. There's no doubt. Based on the name, just they have bald, to be. bald head, big black frame glasses. That's, That's right, right. <laughs> and and you know, an astute high for an offense. Yeah, but Alex Van Pelt's taking over Kevin Stefanski last year with Minnesota. Big additions for this team. You know, they added Jack Conklin, uh, offensive tackle out of uh, came from Tennessee, mm-hmm. was great last year, ninth graded tackle in 2019, just 25 years old. Added Austin Hooper uh, to bring some stability to that tight end position. Sure-handed, high pass volume last year for Atlanta with Austin Hooper. And, uh, you know, you look at the team and everything makes sense on paper. But most of it made sense on paper last year. Where are we with the Browns? Where are we with the sentiment? Jason, I think two days ago, mentioned liking the Browns. Yeah, look, I I was... I, I, As though I'm we haven't around. been here before. Well, I haven't. I mean, you know, last year they were my bold prediction to be the the sucky fantasy team that's going to let everybody down. Um, you know, I, I didn't believe. And this year I do believe because I, while I still question the uh, second year in a row hiring a head coach with very little experience, um, I do think that this head coach without experience is not an a, I, I think Freddie Kitchen was a joke of a head coach, just an absolute catastrophe. The fact that you've come in and you've got a uh, a style, you've got a a, a, a a character to how you want to run a football team, and then what do you do? You go get Jack Conklin on the offensive line. You draft a high tight end. You bring in Austin Hooper. You sign a great fullback, one of the best in the league. They're prepping to be who they – they're going to be able to run the ball like crazy. I think Chubb is going to be awesome. I think Hunt's going to be split out as a slot receiver whenever he's not in the back field as well. They're they're just going to be able to do what they want, positionally speaking, on offense. And I think they have a great defense. So I love the running game. I do think that the passing game will be so much more efficient this season with a healthy Odell Beckham, a better offensive line. But I don't know that they're going to have to you know throw the ball that as much as fantasy owners will want them to. You know, it's it's so I, I took a deeper dive on Baker Mayfield. Uh his rookie year, he was very good. He was the he graded out as pro football focus as number twelve quarterback. He was third in adjusted completion percentage on deep throws at over fifty one percent third. He was great driving the ball down the field and that absolutely deteriorated last year down to twenty fourth. And saw his percentage drop to under forty percent, and it's uh, he wasn't necessarily getting hit all the time, but there was a very large intake in uh, quarterback pressures, which that's because the offensive line was bad. So I do believe that Baker Mayfield can be better. Uh, It's the Stefanski offense is such a question mark to me because how like how much of that is he actually bringing down? Because 
that has huge implications to me for this team, not just on Nick Chubb where you're like, yeah, they they were a great running team in Minnesota. Nick Chubb. I, I like Nick Chubb, but for guys like Jarvis Landry, who 46 of his 83 receptions came from the slot. And in case you're wondering, that was, in fact, about 55% oh! of, of his receptions. And then I took a look. So 46. So that's just Jarvis. 46 of his receptions. 37 wide receiver receptions from the slot last year for Minnesota. For the team. Like, what's going to happen to Jarvis Landry now when he is forced to go back on the outside because the Vikings, in 74% of their plays, had two or few wide receivers on the field. They didn't have a slot. Like, it's, one, it's one of the reasons why I was, I'm was i more interested in Austin Hooper now than I was a, couple, a, a month ago on, on, sure. on first glance. I adjusted him in my rankings uh, earlier this morning. Um, I, I know he's not going to do what he did in Atlanta, but I, I think they brought him there for a reason. I think part of it is what you're saying, Mike, just with the formations that they run and the opportunity. They want to give Baker Mayfield the chance to not look like another blot on the franchise's draft board. Sure. I mean, you so have I to give at, him a chance to succeed. I looked at that, uh, that stuff as well because Minnesota, their highest personnel package was 12 personnel. So you have two tight ends on the field at 34%. Uh, but that, that led to Kyle Rudolph with 48 targets and Irv Smith with 47 targets. Like, yep. There was no standout tight end. Now, we don't have... like It's hard to put data together with, with Baker. Does Baker seem to favor his tight end? Because his rookie year, Njoku had the 88 targets, which was number two for the Cleveland Browns. But when you bring in Odo Beckham, things change. He's, he's going to be a target hog. So I... Uh, it's hard to... Austin Hooper is very difficult for me to gauge because he it, it will not be the offense that he is used to playing, and I I just don't I don't see the world where Austin Hooper really is fantasy relevant unless he's you know he's coming at at tight end ten at the end of the season at which point you're not super happy if you stuck with him week in and week out. I think that's the range where I moved him closer to. I don't think he's going to be a dominant it's fair. player, but I had him. I had him pretty heavily bodied from a production standpoint compared to the year before. Um, there, I just think that Baker's going to be managed. I think that they're going to have to. Twenty interceptions last year. You know the offensive line uh, that's there to help Baker. Kareem Hunt in the slot that's here to help Baker. Austin Hooper. Let's give him some shorter, sure-handed targets for Baker. You cannot be. Jason brought it up. Freddie Kitchens was a joke last year, and part of that yeah. joke. It would go knock knock. Who's there? Odell Beckham targets. No matter what, that was the part of the problem. Is you had a uh, you know a wide receiver on the outside that there was not a rapport with, but you had to try to manufacture targets so he didn't get mad at you. Yeah. So it's hard to see. Yeah, Beck Beckham is a, a tough case as well. This whole team is very interesting. Yeah, it'll be, and it's a it's a tough division. It's going to be a tough right. division for them. It always is, but. Um, Jason, do you have anything you want to add on the uh, Browns side of things? Uh, you know, the only thing I would say is remember it took, it, you know, it seemed like Baker when he had Jarvis at first, that rookie year when he came in, it, it took him a while to develop that rapport. So a healthy Odell Beckham with another year of rapport with Baker. I look, I was very anti Odell last year. I'm, I find myself I want to say very in on Odell this year. Oh, is, my. I know. It's like so off brand. What's yeah, happening? And if, if you look at the reception perception, which is uh, th those reports are available in the Ultimate Draft Kit, uh, where Matt Harmon broke down uh, Odo Beckham, his his conclusion was like he he had to have been hurt because this these are just not the scores that Odo Beckham usually puts up in that metric. All right, the final team that we're going to look at today: the Cincinnati Bengals, two and fourteen last season. 25th ranked rushing offense in yards per game, 19th in passing yards per game, which for a team that's 2-14, and 14, that's a nice number and a testament to Zach Taylor loving to throw the football. Uh, bad defense. This year they added Joe Burrow, obviously, the number one overall pick in the draft, the new quarterback of the future and the present, and then T. Higgins in the second round, first pick of the second round, uh, part of the future at the wide receiver position for the Bengals. I'm on record with my adoration for Joe Mixon, his talent and ability on the field. He's the eighth pick right now in fantasy drafts. Um, 
I think he's going to be great because he's a great running back. And they, sh you look at the back half of last year when they started actually giving him the football, and he was dominant for a very bad team, which is hard to do when you're mm -hmm. a running back. Well, and they they made a they made a change. Like I I went and I looked it up of how were they lining up at the beginning of the year in those first seven or eight weeks, whatever it was, where Mixon was just putrid. They were running out of 11 personnel 80% of the time. And then they made a very strong switch. That number dropped all the way to 59%. So they started changing things up, getting more tight ends on the field. So it, it, this is, so this is another one of those like Rams situation where like is the, are they going to keep going with that because that's what worked? You would think so, but I'm just saying like it it, it was a very large change over the second half. Yeah, it was. And the nice thing, though, is that we've seen Mixon in a couple of systems now have great success with this team. One, two years ago, it was more in the passing game. But a lot to wade through. You know, while we like to conditionalize the output of rookie quarterbacks, things have changed in that department over the years where rookies are able to come in and bring some production to an offense and to some of the pieces of that offense you need only look to Daniel Jones and his ability last year to give you week winning weeks. I was surprised to see how high Joe Burrow was going in some Scotty Fish leagues. Burrow can come in in a Zach Taylor offense and produce with the weapons that he has with Mixon, Green, Boyd, Ross, uh, T. Higgins. Do you feel that way too, Jason? Yeah, I really do. I don't have him projected for that, but you know, we were talking this morning about maybe having a new segment at some point before the year of a range of outcomes ranking, and and Joe Burrow would need to be someone on there because his range of outcomes, I actually, I mean, look, he he's the best. This, I mean, it's it stinks because it was one season. It was one <laughs> season, but that single season was the best quarterback college scouting I've ever seen, and it's not even remotely close. He was. So good. He threw with anticipation. He threw guys open. He checked it down. He can run the ball. Things break down. He's going to get those fantasy points on the ground. I absolutely loved Joe Burrow. So this is kind of a dark horse offense for me. I still don't think their offensive line is good enough to, you know, in that range of outcomes, they would need to gel uh, their offensive tackle. They lost their first round pick last year. He's back. He's healthy. He'd have to dominate. That's a big if those, addition. If those things happen, um, then I could see this being a really good offense. I, I don't project them all to happen in year one, though. Um, and then, I, you know, I do think they want to get T. Higgins involved. They want him on the field. They see him as the future A.J. Green. He's part of the reason I'm down on AJ Green a little bit not that he's going to take AJ Green off the field yeah, he but would I take Ross off the field right yeah you know i i do think though that they're going to be looking uh towards Ross the is future Ross is an unrestricted free agent after this year is that correct they declined yeah, his fifth year a, option yes correct he, they did decline his fifth year option he'll get a ton of money from somewhere because he runs fast i don't know but i don't know about that we'll see oh, just, are you willing just wait. To, are you willing to go hang gliding i'm curious <laughs> No, I am not that, willing to go hang gliding. Now, at least if if the first part of that argument and, and the upside that you see, if for if it were somehow to puzzle piece together with the AJ Green health, that would you'd be you'd be hang gliding. You'd be yes, hang gliding. I would be hang gliding in that situation. If Joe Burrow <laughs> comes in and dominates, the offensive line steps it up, and AJ Green is fully healthy, then he's going to be a steal of drafts. You brought this up on the bounce back um, episode. It's yeah. Just, it's just so tough you know for what's me funny, to see a though? 32 year old who hasn't played in a you, he's just you know. really freaking good and the thing is is when we're as cardinal fans do you remember this for years and years and years with these young quarterbacks what do we always say just just freaking throw yes. the ball to larry just throw, to larry. Just yes. throw yeah. it to larry i who's the best friend of a, of a young rookie it's probably it's the guy probably that's a hall of fame wide receiver that's bigger than everybody so that's my hope i can hope i can dream oh you can, we're we're not stopping you from hoping I did get hope, a DM. Hope floats, that helps your hope hang floats, gliding. Uh, <laughs> hang gliding floats. I got yeah. a DM on Twitter from a, a frequent hang glider that let me know that maybe hang gliding accidents are slightly more prominent than I believe. <laughs> so, so your your hang gliding research was was faulty. I would say almost <laughs> accidentally more accurate, <laughs> in the sense that. It's a little more dangerous to go with AJ Green than right. than what I thought hang gliding was. It's more like what hang gliding actually is, which is, uh, you know, taking a leap from a high location and uh, hoping that you land safely. And that is really 
the AJ Green experience at this point in his career. Now, now, how are you two on very, very, very solid NFL wide receiver Tyler Boyd? I've loved him for a couple of years. I find myself super down on him. I, you know, I, I would take Jarvis Landry hmm. over Tyler Boyd. Uh, I would take Michael Gallup over Tyler Boyd. That's where I'm at, just because I think T. Higgins coming in, the amount of weapons that they have there, and the rookie involved. I'm. You know, I'm just I, I I find myself never wanting Tyler Boyd, even though I think he's a very talented, uh, a, you know, above average, solid NFL wide receiver. Uh, but I, I think that's a really like I'm I'm having trouble lining those these things up. That if if you like Joe Burrow so much, and you don't like AJ Green, like who's producing on this team? And like I, I guess you would mention T Higgins, but you're gonna go. T Higgins, so Higgins T. might Higgins. legitimately not even start. T. Higgins, a second round pick who's done nothing in the NFL. Tyler Boyd, back to back thousand yard seasons, and he is the he's the slot guy. There's like no way no this man this man's no hang gliding. This man's hang gliding. <laughs> no so, one's so, replacing Tyler Boyd's job. Your will. And, I mean, he's extended. So it's it's wild to me that if you have no interest in Boyd, how do you have interest in Burrow? Well, and 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 please, I'm glad you bring this up because obviously it sounded like I said something different. I think that's in his range of outcomes, but that is not what I'm projecting him for. I, I think he will be an extremely talented quarterback, but year one rookie, like I loved Kyler. Kyler coming in last year, I thought was going to be phenomenal for fantasy, but I looked at the wide receiver options and I didn't like those options as much. I didn't like Larry as much because it was like, usually, you know, what's the cap? Like 4,000 yards? Is it going to hit that number? Right. Some rookie quarterbacks do. I've got him projected for over 4,000, but barely. Then if you split that up between AJ Green and Tyler Boyd and T Higgins and John Ross, there's a lot of good weapons here that and be, Joe Mixon. That would be a problem because you could end up with Arizona's receiving output numbers of last year with Kyler Murray, which would exactly. be Christian Kirk, 700 yards, Larry Fitzgerald, 800 yards. Andy Isabella, 200 yards. Keyshawn that's Johnson, how, 200 yards. That's the dirty truth that's how that I could see, come out. That's how I project the Bengals' fantasy offense to be. You heard it here first, Jason. Uh, is going hang gliding against his will. We'll strap him. We'll send him off the cliff. AJ Green, 5,000 yards. That'll do it for today's episode of the podcast. We'll get into some more divisional breakdowns on Saturday's show. for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.